Okay, so before we get rolling with our really, actually, it, it is a special episode today. It's a very unique episode. We've actually never done anything like this today. But uh, before we get there, um, <clears throat> I wanted to say that two things. Number one, I've been having a lot of fun, and I've really enjoyed doing Faith and Capital with you all. Um, a lot of connections and conversations have been had because of this podcast, and I've really, and also, I mean, I've just learned so much. I've learned so much from from endlessly studying and conversing with people from different places and different perspectives, and um, but all generally somewhat interested in this relationship between faith, religion, spirituality, and politics, and um, <clears throat> some of them even revolutionary politics. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you, you all, for having any kind of interest in the show because I would stop, I would immediately cease doing this if there was no interest. Uh, I'm really encouraged, actually, by the uh, the interest that, that's out there. Uh, so yeah, thanks. All right, the other thing I wanted to say, oh yes, my beloved. So our chaplain, our pastor, Brother Chris, Brother Chris, he has not passed, thank God, but he has decided to step out of faith in capital. Um, Chris has a lot on his plate in this uh, in this world right now, and so he has made the correct decision to decide what is more important and what's less important. And faith in capital uh, was on the less important list. So um, best to him uh, and and. I mean, there could be a future where Chris comes back. I really, I personally really, really enjoyed spending this time and having these conversations with Chris. Um, but I am really proud of him for making some good decisions on determining what is primary and secondary. All right, so that's all for those announcements. And I guess we'll go ahead and transition into this episode. This episode was really cool. I got to talk with Frank Lopez of the Left Page Pod, which is a leftist uh, kind of literary podcast. Frank has done like 50 plus episodes on essays and articles and books, um, uh, a lot of fiction, uh, really, really fascinating, interesting stuff. And and, and I think it's a really interesting podcast because it pulls out themes that really grasp us, I would say. And today we're actually going to be talking about utopia, which of course is a, I would say it's a very interesting topic because uh, a lot of Christian and religious people think in utopian manners, right? Kingdom of God, is that a utopia or is that um, a real project that can fully be established? And then on the other hand, uh, communists. A lot of people think of communism as a utopian project. Now, um, I think in the conversation, I'll try and push back against the idea that communism is a utopian project, but it's popular. It's popularly uh, imagined as a utopia. So anyways, there's a lot of interesting things, but what we do in this uh, conversation is we discuss two essays. And the first one is the Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas by Ursula Le Guin and The Ones Who Stay and Fight by N.K. Jemison. These are two short stories. So I have linked both of the short stories in the show notes. Please go check them out. They're really interesting, fascinating reads. There's a lot to be said, uh, more than that could have been said in my conversation with Frank. But without further ado, here's my conversation with Frank Lopez of The Left Page Pod, generally on utopia and responsibility. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the left page, or should I say the left page and faith and capital crossover collab project. Um, (laughs) I am Frank. I'm your always online historian, academic and writer. And in this also quite different project, we're going to do something even more different from what I usually do. Because we're going to discuss two different, yet deeply related, short stories. Because we usually did one. It's Ursula K. Le Guin's The Ones Who Walk Away From Mobilas. And N.K. Jemsen's The Ones Who Stay and Fight. And to join me, we have from the podcast of Faith and Capital and Mass Struggle, Chase. Welcome. Yo. Hey, Frank. I'm super excited to hang out tonight. And it's been fun to 
kind of had this in the back of our heads for a little bit, but finally yeah. we we cranked it out. And these are two fun, interesting essays. And and as we've kind of messaged back and forth, it's, it's going to be a cool conversation. Oh, absolutely! Like it's. <laughs> I mean, oh, I as I was mentioning before, I'm I'm big on utopianism and thinking about utopias. So this is like, yeah, and and Le Guin. So it's like, yes, I'm never going to say no to talking about Le Guin. So you know, <laughs> and, and yeah, and and Le Guin is one of the few fiction writers on my shelf. And um, as I mentioned to you earlier uh, before we started recording, I am terrible at reading fiction. I want to read more fiction. I think there's just uh, so much like benefit to it. I mean, like as a person, you know, just yeah. uh, engaging narrative and, and creativity and, and story, um, but also like as a thinker as well to engage things in, in a more uh, creative light as well. But um, I struggle to read fiction. <laughs> so um, these short stories were nice uh, for me. So, yeah, I'm excited. No, that's good. <laughs> That'd be to, to make it like bite sized in that point. Like that's fine. Like sometimes it's even and I speaking to friends who have like you know they they have a career in academia or building that or or whatever or during their graduation, you know that they have a time afterwards that where they just can't read or have a really yeah. hard time doing that. So yeah, and and I per, I mean personally I just read a bunch of theory and history. Yeah, and so when I get when I get to story, it's either like through television, like, like a TV show or uh, in my religious community, you know, I think yeah. those are like the two ways that I engage story and fiction, but I really, obviously there's just so much more benefit to reading fiction books. It's like, like Le Guin, as we mentioned, Octavia Butler, those are two people that um, yeah. I have read in the past. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, I think like that's, Fiction can do so much and in a lot less space in a lot of different ways. Like I've I mentioned this before and I'll never stop talking about this. Like the dispossessed has literally changed my life, both mm. in how I engage with, I don't know, anarchism in terms of literature, in terms of utopia and utopianism. And like, you know, thinking about that, like not, not in a cynical way, but in like a sincere engagement. And it's, it's my thesis dissertation's focus now. So it's, it, it, it has changed and continues to change me with every reread, with every analysis, every secondary literature I read about it. It, it only serves to be this like building block to where mm -hmm. I continue to develop my, my politics, my academic work, my research and my understanding in terms of fiction and what fiction can do. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, I love Le Guin and Le Guin's work. It's powerful, yeah. And like it was, it, it's something that I came up with like fairly randomly, really. It was a collaboration that I did with Pearson Bolt from Coffee with Comrades. And he, we were trying to do something together and he suggested this book. And I hadn't heard of Le Guin before. I, I didn't even know there was a translation Portuguese. And it was like I read in English and I was really impressed about it. And then uh, we chatted and it was a wonderful time. And I continued to think about it. And I was like, well, I could research something. Why not this? And then I went down the rabbit hole and I continue to love that book more and more. Sweet. Yeah. And then we were uh, we were mentioning how you're looking into the, well, is it called the Earth Sea? The... Well, no, it's because uh, you have like the, the Earth Sea is the sort of high fantasy stuff that, that she mm. did. And she did most of it before, like it's from mid to late sixties that she published most of the the Earth Sea cycle. Hmm. And, and that's like some wizard. That's like yeah, all wizard of like Earthsea. wizardry and stuff. Yeah, yeah cool. Nice. <laughs> and and then like the the Hainish cycle, which is the sci-fi one, she started hmm. publishing in like at the late sixties, and then the Left Hand of Darkness, which is her other famous work, is from sixty nine. Then you have the dispossessed from 74. And while this seems, or this all may seem like a tangent, it's relevant to the, the one we're talking about, the ones who walk away from Omalas, which is from 73. And in the ways that Le Guin refers to this short story and the comparison to dispossessed, because mm -hmm. he refers to one of the, well, main characters, though she's already dead, uh, which is the anarchist and main anarchist from the historical movement that led to the dispossessed and that utopia and, and all that, uh, which is Odo, 
and she like when refers to Odo as one one who would walk away from Omelas. It's different, oh, not necessarily the same kind of story, but same type of figure and idea. So with all that in mind, and and the effects that this story had with Le Guin's other fiction, like she wrote this short story, she wrote Dispossess, and then she wrote the day after the or the day before the revolution, which is a story from the point of view of Odo. So hmm. it's a uh, th- this story is an important part of it. Oh yeah, I had no idea. So that that's really cool to learn. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, happy to, happy to share. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so do you wanna um, you wanna try and, and <laughs> uh, uh, sort of I don't know uh, summarize the ones who walk away from Omelas? Hmm. Yeah. Well, I think they're. I mean, generally, we could step back and yeah, and in a brief, briefly, say that they're that Le Guin says here's this um, utopian society, and she actually spends some some time trying to convince the reader that it's real. And this is something that comes up again yeah. um, with the Umhala story as well. The ones who stay and fight. But so Le Guin is arguing uh, for this reality that is again, very u- utopic. There, it's there's um, there's like a parade. Everyone seems happy. Um, everyone's like treating each other right. And, and she doesn't mention capitalism, but she says there's, you know, there is no slavery and there are no, there's no feudalism. There are, there are no monarchs. Um, she doesn't mention anything about like wage exploitation, but she really does spend some time trying to depict a, uh, a society where people are just joyous and festive and full of happiness, right? Uh, yeah. And bliss. And... Which I think itself, I mean, we we could get into whether it really is like you know, you know like like what's happening here. One thing I I think um, that is interesting about the ones who walk away from Omelas is that um, they are conscious of what is to come. You know yeah. what you know what we can also talk about the 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 fact that it's not a utopia. Or, or, that that's a question. Is like is it a utopia or not? Because it's not for everybody. And so for me, I'm not even sure if if utopia like what role that really should play in our political development mm-hmm. um I, you know coming from a communist perspective i you know i don't think communism is a utopia even though there are some socialist marxists and communists who would say communism a world of communism is utopic but uh, for me it's just the end of class society and class struggle mm-hmm. both the relations and the ideology and and i think that is uh, actually a, a materially uh, possible world it's not the end of 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 um everything <laughs> you know it's not the end of contradiction it's not an end of history no it's definitely not the end of, it would not be the end of history and communism would not be uh, a world without problems we would still have yeah. problems but we would not have class struggle and all the problems that are produced by that so here this story is interesting right because the because Le Guin says here's a utopic society it's really beautiful it's really fun it's really joyous you have to believe it is and on one hand I actually felt and Frank I, I wanted to hear if you picked up on this as well did you do you get the sense that both Le Guin and uh, our other author as well they are kind of like pushing against a liberal like nihilism I think so I, like I think especially. Uh, Jemson's one of uh, that comes across like b- just because of the tone. The tone is more direct, more uh, confrontational. Where this mm-hmm. one is more uh, narrative, like a storytelling aspect, like telling a story, but that you want to believe it. And the other one feels like it's trying necessarily to both persuade and convince you. Yeah, we, yeah which I find interesting because the first half of uh, like both of the essays, but you're right. The, the ones who walk away from Omelas is much more like, you know, uh, of, a, of a story, I would say. Yeah. And so she's trying to persuade us that there is this utopic society and voila, that uh, here it is. But then she's like, also it's uh, it's not as perfect as you think. <laughs> so I don't know. What do you think about that? I guess before we go, go any further uh, uh, with the story, for you, is utopia like some kind of perfect idealist world, or is it, or is it like a real 
material world that can be realized. For me, I, I've always thought of utopia as something that's idealist. Yeah. Um. Uh, but but what do you think? I mean, like for me, and, and that's a, a great part of like my recent, I don't know, <laughs> it's, mo- it's mostly literary development over the past couple of years uh, as I've been working up towards now when I'm writing my dissertation where like I, I had the same idea of utopia as, you know, it's this idealist place that it's that it's not necessarily useful for uh, Marxism or class struggle or anything of the sort. But then I came across that it's possessed and it, it, it's representation of, as the subtitle says, an ambiguous utopia. And then I started reading on the scholarship and an understanding of, you know, it's, it's not a utopia, but it's still utopian. And that distinction of like, you know, utopia is impossible. Utopia is idealist. Utopia is unachievable. And it is an end of history as a lot of the times it's commonly imagined, depicted, or spoken about. But that utopianism, that stru- and, and it, it, it shows up in a variety of ways. Uh, I'm thinking a lot about Ernst Bloch. Uh, he talks about hope and, and utopianism a lot. But it, it's a sense of... You, how did I put it before? Like, um, it, it shows up in a, a few ways, but it's so, essentially you sacrifice the utopia or this idea of the end into a, a sort of practice of utopianism or, or a dreaming and a working towards that. That is unachievable, but you sort of develop that into a horizon instead of an endpoint. And in that way, like, I, I, I think... I'm starting to, or I've been trying to think about ways to imagine these actions of utopianism or, or dreaming or being mm-hmm. utopian um, mm-hmm. and, you know, striving for a better world, but that isn't an end in itself. And in a way, Le Guin does that later with the dispossessed, but here it is, it's a world that seemingly is a utopia, but how do you fit in that that, that problem within? Do you define it as a utopia or, or do you change? Because like some of the reading, we'll, we'll get into this shortly, but a lot of the readings say it's like, oh, any great society or any good society or, or for something to be like this, it requires a great sacrifice. It requires pain or like this is a demand. And it's like, it's a, a read, but I find it interesting, um, especially what uh, effectively developed into her other stories and the role of even the title, the people who do walk away. Hmm. So... Uh, we'll, we'll get into that. I'm, I'm not. I don't want to get too much ahead of myself. But for me, I, I think utopia has become to me an image. It, it's mostly an image. It's a symbol. It's not a, a project. I think that's the key. Like you sacrifice the project, but you preserve it as a dream. I think that's a, a, a almost a quote from uh, the researcher Tom Moylan. He, he's got some brilliant works on on utopia and utopianism, and. I think for me, like, rather than thinking like, oh, we will create utopia. No, but we can strive for utopianism, for utopias, never to reach it. Like, it requires, uh, it's self-critical in that sense. That, like, you're not going to get there, but the effort towards it, it's still just as significant. It's mm. like pres- an effort of practice and imagination and mm. building those things together. And in a sense, like, it's... <laughs> It's difficult then, after you go through all that, to sort of define, is this utopia in, for either of those stories? And I have, you know, I had more issues with the second story than I expected from what I had heard of it before. Um, while I, I, and I read Omelas quite some time ago. But, um, I don't know, I, I think for me, like the, if there is a utopia, it can't be... And this is uh, also an, a scholar thing and a research thing and the way I argue it. But you know, defining utopia needs to be an, an absolute utopia for everyone. Like it's, um, it's that, that's how I usually and try to define utopia. Because, you know, and, and even it, it shows up so, oh, to give an example, like the world we live in is a type of utopia for the super hyper duper wealthy. Like it, it is utopian for them. But it's it, 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 and it's like oh it's their utopia, but like I I ref- I don't like using utopia in that sense so that, as this superior or this better or this great society, uh, or a society where you're comfortable or better in. It's like in order to be utopia, it needs to be for everyone, and that that's the the way I find it. And like it's um, 
And there's issues with the isolation tradition of utopias and literature, how it shows up, but we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, mm. uh, uh, do stop me if I ramble on, because I've well, been thinking about this for uh, over a year and a half now, maybe two. No, yeah, th- that's helpful. I, I would, uh, something you said made me think of, um, when I read The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas, I do think of like a settler colony or an yeah. imperialist center, an imperial power. And, and maybe we can maybe continue with the story to help explain oh, yeah. why that would be the case. Does, does that, uh, that sound cool? No, that's perfect. That, that sounds Sweet. excellent. Okay, so yeah, Le Guin beautifully paints this really joyous, festive community. And then she gets to a place where she says, but there's this secret, right? Uh, there's this uh, part of the community that that the community's happiness and the beauty of the city and the character of their friendships, she says, and the health of the people and the the wisdom and the skill and even the harvest and weather is believed um, to depend upon this one phenomena. And there's a child, I think, uh, in a in a basement somewhere, locked in a in a room. Um, maybe maybe a tiny window, uh, maybe not, but it's this child who is basically being tortured in solitary confinement. Yeah. And, and everyone says that this is necessary for Omelas to continue to exist. Um, now, I think one of the things that we can interrogate is, is it true that Omelas needs this to persist you know to protect its happiness or is it what is perceived right because yeah. when you think about like uh white people in the u.s like white people are constantly being told and they then they tell themselves as well that uh combating settler colonialism or um white supremacy itself like undermines the well-being of the masses of people who think of themselves as white right um when really I mean, the masses of people presently in the U.S. who who do, uh, like myself, who do uh, benefit from white supremacy, we would all much more, you know, be way, be way better off if we ended capitalism, imperialism, and colonialism, yeah. including white supremacy, right? Yeah. Um, so it's like the difference between perception and reality. Yeah. That's interesting. And, and that's like, that's one of the things that, you know, in my first read of it, I, I, I thought about, but it's... This, the sto- it's interesting how most of the discussion, and, and that's one way that I, I also want to think about it, it's like, okay, you take that as a fact or as something that is, it's like, what then? But before we get to that, like, I I, I, th- I think that it's it's mostly a, a sense of perception or like it's it's sort of that extreme counterpoint that's like, oh, um, and you know, that the one that uh, traditionally... Uh, <laughs> In terms of fascism, really, where the you have the perpetual enemy or you have the enemies, and you know you always need to strive upon them. It's not the same thing because the child is not is not clear place as an enemy, but it's like it's essential, it's necessary, mm. and I think that is one of the more interesting aspects of this story, at least especially or rather especially in comparison, uh, in terms of conscience, because like it's it said that every single citizen of Omalas visits the child and needs to visit the child it's almost like um i know a, a, a rite of a rite of passage or something or or in, in uh, entering the society for real in, in adulthood and so on so like it's not as like oh i don't know or something no you know mm-hmm. everyone knows at least at one point yeah you're absolutely right and i think Le Guin mentions that omelas is a guiltless society so, yeah. so to remain within Omelas, you shed the accountability, the responsibility of any feelings of guilt. And so you consciously know that there is uh, a, perhaps at one point you're like, oh, there's a suffering child. But then eventually, ideologically, you get to the place where, no, like the child is better off locked in this cage and we are all better off and and honestly yeah. if we if that was if that were to end then um not only would we you know 
lose Omelas, but the but the child uh, has just been tortured too much to the to the point where yeah. it would not survive. Well, it is now better off in the condition that it is in. Yeah, it becomes um, a self deception in that regard. Like, yes. no, the child is better off. Yeah, yeah, and so I think there's like an interesting he, uh, question here around ideology. And, oh yes, because um, they go and as you said, right? There's a ritual. There's some kind of it's almost like a religious like uh, practice, a coming of um, age thing. Yes, exactly, coming of age. There's like a liturgy involved where, as young children, they take the young children, and throughout their you know their young adult years and even um, as adults, so they can always kind of go to this place. And it's this practice that's informing, I think, ideas. And they, they develop these ideas about why it's necessary, um, what's happening. And uh, they wrestle with, well, what if, you know, we were to address this issue? Um, or, and, but eventually, I think they, they practice and they think and they practice, I think, enough. They get to the place where um, it's actually not an issue at all. It's a necessity. It's a yeah. good. The, the torturing um, isolation uh the the brutality uh is no longer brutality it's actually a good yeah yeah no uh, precisely a and i think that informs i mean as we go on to the story what what people do and how people react uh, which effectively what what happens uh, as we're told like uh, after this sort of ritual is people you know accept it or, or you know, sort of uh, sublimated or, or try to forget or try not to think about it or, you know, there's a variety of experiences. And then ultimately we reach the <laughs> the ones who title the story themselves, the ones who in, in the face of that decide to walk away, to sort of abandon Omalas into the face of, of the unknown. And I think that's interesting because uh, Omalas, in, in the way that it is, a traditional, in that regard, literary utopia, it has no history. It has no future and no past. It, it is simply this continual state of affairs, which is this existence with a child, and there always will be a child, and there's nothing to be done about that, and, and the, the society continues and people accept or, or people leave. And to leave means, you know, rejection of everything the rejection of all that they know and, and like this true embracing of an unknown and a potential unknown and i i think it's telling that where we're not told where they go or where even they can go i think that's really interesting it's like they go where um but they go away and and like it's you know it, it's one of the things that also shows up when talking about the stories like Oh, why? Why don't they just, you know, rescue the child or whatever or something? That, that that's that kind of thing. But like, in, in what ways? What what would that mean? What would it mean to sort of rescue the child? In, in one way or another, it's like, I, th I think it, that's why I think it's interesting. It's like, in as a role of ideology, uh, as you were saying it, that's like people believe that the child needs to be there. So a child not being there, what? It almost leads me to think that they would put another child there, mm. it's like without thinking too much about it. Otherwise, you know, maybe the entire society could fall. Yeah, I remember discussing this short story back in seminary a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and yeah, the question at the very end uh, that everyone asks is, "All right, so what do you do? Right? Do you do you stay? Do you uh, do you leave? Are there other options?" and uh, I mean, and we, you know, we could play around and experiment that, uh, experiment with that, like ethically and and morally. Um, but one of the things that jumped out to me in this reading that I don't remember picking up on the first time was um, the words that the ones who walk away will now walk to somewhere quote even less imaginable end quote and quote hmm. know where they are going. End quote. Huh. And so I thought those two lines were really interesting because yeah, I don't remember I hadn't that. Right? Picked up on them. Yeah, because like at, at the end of the story, it's like, well, the ethical question: Do you stay? Do you go? What do you do? But um, I did. I I kind of just want to ask Le Guin because um, <laughs> they could be important lines. They could be uh, you know interesting lines. They could not. Maybe they're just like random things that she kind of threw in the end. But 
Um, it's interesting to say, okay, you were you were already in the least imaginable place, Omelas, but it turned out to be, I mean, in my mind, kind of like a settler colony and imperialist core, yeah. <laughs> um, full of reactionaries <laughs> who who are dishonest and, and like yeah. idealist about their existence in the world. So, but then but now she's saying, oh, but now the ones who are walking away are going to a place even less imaginable. It's like, is that a good thing and a bad thing? I'm not for sure anymore. <laughs> But they still have this level of consciousness, right? They know where they are going. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think that's one of the really interesting that sticks out to me, especially comparing Omelas and Umhalat, um, yeah. uh, the, the Jemison story that, we're, that we'll discuss as well, is that I think in Omelas, there's a level of consciousness that does not exist in Umhalat. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think that that is the key way to look at the two stories. We, and I think you picked it up on that beautifully really and i think that's a good point of transition i i just want to mention on those those two lines like at least the way i see it is they're like they're not going anywhere like concrete but they're like they they know how a society can be like that but they want to do something even better like that, that's not enough like to omelas is not enough for them like omelas is still and like I, I take that a lot more symbolic and metaphorical. It's like such a place does not exist, but that is the effort they'll do, which I would call a utopian effort. <laughs> yeah. So there is this interesting thing um, where the question around utopia, right? Yeah. Uh, so in in the religious world, we or at, you know, in the Christian world, uh, for folks who are kind of somewhat familiar with it, I'm sure people have heard of the like the the now and yet to come, you know, we talk about this yeah. quote unquote kingdom of God, and it's it's basically this idea. I to me, it's a symbol. It's a symbol um, to which we are striving, but also it this symbol then shapes our practice in the now. Yeah. Um, and and I do think there's an interesting kind of discussion and debate between whether that is as helpful as um, having like having imagination about real worlds that are possible uh, mm-hmm. to be realized and and which i would say that's not the utopian line but yeah. i think my christian tradition is in a more utopian line but i think the my uh, communist politics takes me to um, a different way of thinking uh, and engaging that i mean what do you think frank do you do you see what i'm talking about the, oh absolutely different... <laughs> yeah so uh, what do you think about like the the tensions and the contradictions between those two different ways of engaging uh, either utopia or engaging, I mean, needing imagination, right? We need political imagination to realize real worlds that are possible um, and to escape the ideology that is constantly training us in this world, right? In this homeless to normalize the suffering, to normalize the uh, exploitation and oppression. Oh, absolutely. But on the other hand, it's not like, um, I think uh, a more communist approach would say, we're not trying to imagine something impossible and yeah. hope that pulls us in a better way. What do you think? I, I, it's uh, an- another of the, the spinier points about the whole discussion, <laughs> but like, no, but th- that's the cool bit. And that's why we're here. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it's interesting. Like I, at least for me, I think that, you know, we, we, we strive here on earth in, in, from a Christian traditions, like trying to, you know, reach the kingdom of heaven but it's it's important to to bring uh, uh, that other effort of you know establishing the kingdom of heaven on earth uh that call to action really and what that can mean and in that way that can be a much more concrete effort i think than just you know it, it is we you you abide your time on earth and you do what you can and then and then you pass away over to the next life but the, there is that call to to action and you know in the, in the imitation of christ and and doing action not just in it's like no i'm doing this and doing this it's like what it, what is it supposed to mean and why why are you doing all this here is it just uh like a palliative action is just like remedying certain problems or are you actually what are, are you you know trying to fix or, or remedy things or are you building things or striving to build these things and I think that's one way I established the distinction. But when you bring on the other utopian elements and uh, especially Marxism, it's, it's a little more difficult, especially in terms of imagination, that 
and I think it's it's one of the uh, things that Mark says at one point. I don't remember when. You you probably remember it more precisely, but where where Mark says at one point that's like it's difficult to imagine the the proper realities or, or challenges that a communist society will have because we're not in it, and we we are st- we are under uh, capitalist ideology and capitalist society and and those problems and those preconceptions. So to imagine or try to imagine what that next society will be in clear, drawn terms is a vain effort. And to that degree, I 100% agree. Um, and, uh, however, I think that the effort is like, and I think that's where the limitation comes from, like to try and imagine like, you know, the blueprint. I think the issues with the blueprint, when you're trying to do something more akin to, and I think both these I don't know about Jameson, but I, at least, and I don't mean this negatively, but I know that Le Guin at least didn't mean in this point. She meant it as fiction, as, you know, a literary work. That That's the point. And in that regard, it's like, it's not bound by those same rules as a, a blueprint as a project. And she encompasses and brings about differences and problems. So like, sure, this may be utopia or a utopia or a, a much better, greater society. However, that's not all. And even then, it's still significant because I mentioned like it's a society that really has no history, has no time, and yet it still has these people that leave. So there's still, things still happen. There's a sense of history there. And, you know, it's, I think the way to try and bring all those things together is that like, in what ways are those actions effectively working on the present? Like, what does it mean to be a utopianism today, not for for a tomorrow, but to do that today. In that same way is like engaging praxis and being a communist today, not just like oh a sacrifice for it. No, like today is like this focus on the present. Of course, for a, a, a tomorrow, but that that it ultimately realizes and tries to work on the current society, the current time, the current place. So I think that's that's my provisional answer because it's. Oof. Uh, I feel like I'm slightly getting out of my league, but I'm trying my best. Oh, no, this is, uh, I mean, if it's not your league, it's not my league, it's not anybody's <laughs> league. So, you know, we're all just kind of like discussing and, and dialogue and learning together. Oh, yeah. You know, one of the things that popped in my head just hearing you talk, and I, and I know we want to move on to Umaha, but um, the, the I, I wonder if there's like this this line where sometimes people who are like, no, utopia, you know, utopia, we should just like imagine the best thing we can do it and just, and just hope we kind of go in that direction. And then there's this other, um, I would, I would say it's like a a more dogmatic kind of scientific approach where, Mm -hmm. no, this is the world that is materially realizable. And this is exactly how we are going to realize it, which I think is like bullshit. I mean, any communist who's, who, uh, especially in the U.S., who says, "Oh, you know, all we have to do is just this." You know what I'm saying? Now, uh, those are people you probably don't need to waste your time listening to. Um, but I do think you know, communist struggle it needs to be put on a scientific base. And as you were saying, mm-hmm. um, you were talking about like doing the work today, and I think that is uh, requires us to understand and analyze and assess the present situation and con- uh, contradictions and, and the conditions um, and and understand how we can develop it. Um, yes, we we do want to struggle towards this uh, socialist revolution and then a socialist transition through to communism, but we actually don't really know what exactly that's going to look like yeah. because everything's constantly changing. And that's um, so... But that's also not a utopian line, though, uh, as well. Um, or perhaps, you know, you might call it like a new kind of utopian. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So I think there's there's an error to say that, uh, yes, like we need to approach things and put it on a scientific base. And then someone might say, and there's no imagination needed, right? We don't need any kind of creativity. And I, I completely reject that. Yeah. And then on the, the other hand, we might be able to, I would say, there there could be an air of swinging too far oh, yeah. to the, it's all creativity, all imagination, and we don't really need to learn anything from the past or present. I mean, that's like one of the things that like the whole age of Aquarius thing in the 60s is like, oh, just need to imagine this other society and other things and like things will be better. Oh, not quite. Interesting. 
It's, <laughs> yeah, it's one of the yeah, things that, that I've been reading about utopianism and utopia, I, utopian ideas and ideas of utopia. Uh, nice. Oh, imagine. Let's just imagine it, y'all. Let's just imagine. <laughs> if only it were so simple. And we uh, wish. Exactly. exactly. Uh, it's, and that's like, that's like, it, it's somewhere in between. Like, it's, it, of course, it's an effort of imagination, but like, there's solid, concrete, material work. It's like, yeah. that, that's kind of the point. And, and like, well, that's one of the things that I do, both with fiction and with this idea of utopia. It's like, okay, but it is an idea in the present. It, of course, it's an idea, but it's a present. It's, it's, a mater- it's, it's an idea that exists in the world and that has certain consequences, not in the ways that uh, conservatives and even liberals uh, have done it in the past. Like, oh, <laughs> oh I'm, I, I, anti-utopia pisses me off. Uh, or anti-utopianism, but it's like, oh, the utopia is a reason for bloodshed. It causes, you know, violence, which is what Karl Popper says. Uh, but yeah, oh, anyway, really? yeah. uh, wow. not, let me not get too sidetracked. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's like it's it's about it's a materialism, and it's like this construction. Like I think one of the the things that 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 shows up in in both fields, so to speak, is like a sort of sacrificing of the present. Or this idea of a sacrifice for the present for you know a better tomorrow or whatever, but it's like, is that really? And, and of course, this brings eth- eth- I'm bringing ethics to the point, but like, is that really something you know good? Is that something right to be done? To be done, and like, is that something moral? Is is that is that legitimate to be done? Th- this utter sacrifice of the present, and it all becomes a lot more tangled and complicated, but like, I think that's why it's important that this action and this praxis and this, these actions today in this present and not like forgetting about the future, but like precisely on account of it. It's like, it's not just about like, Oh, uh, precisely on that point. It's like, Oh, this, these actions will do that and they will necessarily create that or they will work towards no, like, but like, what are we also doing for this today, or like in a, in a shorter scope, not just in a sort of abstract long term. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. <laughs> I'm I, sorry. Think, I think there's there's a lot there, and, and I, absolutely, it's all good. I'm sorry. No, no, it's all good. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah. So, shall we get to the second story? Yeah, let's go ahead and do it. Yeah. Oh, this has been great. I'm loving this. Totally. So the the I'll, I'll go for this one. So the ones who stay and fight by N. K. Jemsen. She's also famous for the Broken Earth trilogy, uh, which is apparently very successful. Uh, also, sort of dystopian and whatnot. I've not read it yet. This is the only thing I've read from her, which is a fault, uh, mostly as someone working on sci-fi. But anyway, the, the story it's it's from twenty eighteen, so it's it's fairly recent, and effectively it's it's extremely similar to Omelas. The tone is slightly different. It's a lot more confrontation. It's like, oh, you don't, you don't believe this is possible. Like this, this idea of society, and there's a similar festival going on, and it's it, it's this idyll- idyllic reality. And it's like there's technology, there's good relations, there's people living well, and however, and I think that is no no the, therein lies it ends up lying the issue like it's it, it sort of comp- it's weird because it sort of compares it's like oh with this abstract uh you know listener or reader it's like oh you don't believe this is possible and yet in america or in the society of america it, it's like this when we're also not like omalas where there's this suffering child so it's as, as chase uh, wrote it down in our outline uh, it's a society that perceives itself to be conscious and aware of what it's trying to do and what is what it can do or what it should do and what it's continuing to do. And it does the similar attack. And I think that's a, a good point, which you also brought about before, like attacking this uh, liberal nihilism or this idea. It's like, oh, there is no alternative. This is all there is, which is uh, an idea I'm fundamentally opposed to as well. But it, it poses that really... You know, this is a society that exists. You you believe it not, and yet, you know, th- we have this. There's this going on. There's this going on. However, and it's not a however in the story, uh, or at least not as clearly, uh, because in in Omelas, 
the, there's a very quick turn. It's like, oh, you you feel the society, you don't believe in the society, but what would you say if I tell about this? And then there's a reaction in terms of the society and how they they react to it. So it's very much shown as like the negative thing. Like no one has any doubt that the child is a the suffering child is a bad thing, but it's necessary, and they may justify it. They may you know. Um, reimagine it or re-signify it however they may see fit but no one believes a suffering child is a good thing but it is for their case so uh, uh, that's important however i'm helot in this case which which is the the society and the ones who stay and fight it's purporting to the same things but then there is this we're being told it, it, it's a bit strange but apparently it's this sort of this parallel reality uh, to our own and there's a sort of leakage, and information passes through from media, radio, whatever, um, to Amhelat. And this knowledge is seen as evil, as like this knowledge of possible evils, as like a disease, or this possibility of wrongdoing by those that the information gleaners, which I also found strange, but effectively they're seen as like a, a potential evil that will spread. And you have these caretakers who are the ones that sort of guard Amhelot against that. And in order to do that, well, they, you know, hunt down and uh, kill the ones uh, who have been in contact or are spreading this information uh, in Amhelot. And ultimately what what happens is that one of these people is killed, and but they have a child. And ultimately, like, the, uh, the society, like, what will they do to this child? Are they, will they leave it to suffering? It's like, and they're, they're trying to offer to like, you know, bring it together. It's like, it's not, and then sort of lies the commentary against Omelas. Like in Omelas, people leave, but in here, you know, people stay and, and fight and fight this issue and fight these, the spreading evil. And, you know, it's not about abandoning the child, but about bringing it together and, and you know, staying and fighting. Um, do you think, think that's a good enough summary, Chase? Yeah, no, it was great, right? Here's the utopia society, and then you realize, or but there's a there's a less conscious element yeah. in this society. In Omalas, they are very, very highly conscious of what's happening and why it has to happen, and they rationalize that explicitly. And Umhal and Umhalat or Umhalat, you know, however, who knows? Um, yeah, <laughs> however you want to pronounce it. Um, the masses of people are not aware. Yeah. of the other kind of like parallel universe which is ours and they're not aware of the past of the city or the town which was violence and they're not aware that there are these so-called guardians of knowledge right yeah. guardians of of the truth um and so that's what these underground information people are trying to spread um, the the truth about and kind of awaken people to the consciousness. Now I did have a question because mm -hmm. this this story was it was a little weird like like for me. I, yeah, I, it, I, I it found it strange. From, yeah, I, I did too. I think that's a good way to put it because I was expecting something more similar to Omelas, and then something like like basically, uh, I mean, as the uh, the word suggests, like instead of walking away. They like go and they like organize within the city, which it sounds you, you might you might think that well, that's what, exactly what's happening in Umhala, but it, it's really not what's happening in Umhala no, too. No, it's <laughs> it's a lot more like a secret police kind of thing. Exactly. So that's what I was wondering. First of all, the the ones who stay and fight. Just for clarification, th that is the the information gleaners, right? Um, I don't know. No, I I think. Or no, are I'd they the, the secret guardians? I think they're the caretakers. Oh, see, no, yeah, and then I don't know it, like, because I I went into this story but with the same, because like I I took a course on like Le Guin and, and this the Hainish cycle stories, and the the person who ran the course I need to talk to him later after about this. Should have beforehand, but anyway, um, and he recommended this story, as you know, it's like this. Oh, if you had the ones that the ones who walked away. These these are the ones who stay and fight, so, but I don't know because like the because if we're, the, the that's a sentence from what the, the person the, the the speaker in the story is like one of either one of the guardians or one who's on the side of the guardians, 
So when they say that, that's the kind of fight they're talking about. This fight against these information gleaners and the ones that are sort of spreading this evil knowledge. But it's it's strange. It's not is not what the f- phrase would expect. You, again, like I had this exact same expectations. So like they would be organizers or you know something a lot more collective or something against a current society. Mm-hmm. But the structuring is so strange mm-hmm. because it takes that same structure and presentation as uh, Omelas, as mm-hmm. you know, this utopian society, is this festival day, here's a lot about the society. However, and, and we go from there, but the conclusion is very different. O- Omelas has a much more sort of suspended conclusion. You don't know exactly where it, or what it points to. But Omela, it, it, it sort of points to a present, but it's, I don't know. I, I, I have the distinct impression that I'm yeah. re- poorly reading this story. Well, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, well, I do well, have that I'm joining feeling, you, but I don't then, think then I... I do. <laughs> well, you're not alone in that then, because I'm I'm feeling something similar. Um, just to make sure the the listeners understand, right? Here, here's a here's a supposed uh, a a suggested utopia society, and then a child is is with her father in these. There are secret guardians of the truth uh, of the knowledge of the other world and of the past of this town as well and it's all about violence they talk about they talk about the truth as being a disease an evil the the knowledge of wrongdoing of our world and and yeah. violent relations and it's a it's a contamination to know about these things both of the past and of the other world in say america or in, in omelas and so these guardians are trying to protect the community from hearing about this. And actually a few things are popping in my head right now, but, <laughs> um, but it comes up to uh, a, a man is like captured by these guardians. He's spreading. He, he, he's out. I can't remember exactly what he's doing, uh, but he's trying to, he's one of these underground information gleaners trying to spread the information about the other diseased, violent world and the diseased, violent past. And so they kill him um, and they kill him right in front of the child. And so then you have a child here and, and the question is, well, well, then what do you do with a child? And what they, what they uh, choose to do is to re-educate the, the child, uh, to, to teach the child um, in their like, perspective and in, in their view uh, why it is so necessary to have killed her father, um, why it's really, really important and why we must continue to do the important work of protecting Umhalat from these uh, underground information people who are trying to uh, spread this disease things. And two things pop in my mind, uh, Frank, uh, we can go either way. Uh, I just want to name it real quick. First of all is this story of Eden in the garden and Genesis. And the second thing was, <laughs> what was my, it was like one of my favorite little thriller movies um, by a Shyamalan guy. Um, oh, The Village. The village. Wow. So, all right. So, uh, I'll start with the village and then come back to the scripture. Mm-hmm. The, the village thing seems really similar to me, right? They create this utopic society in their mind. They lie to everyone, and um, so there's a complete absence of consciousness amongst the the vast majority of people, except for the elders, of really what their history was, and um, and who they really are, and how they relate to the rest of the world. Uh, but I mean, not to go into all the particulars of that story. It's a great movie if you want to check it out, y'all. Uh, but yeah, then they and they come to they have to tell the truth in the end. Um, and but they've been lying the whole time, and they've uh, they thought they were protecting, but really they were just uh, kind of recreating their own kind of terror, I would say. Um, and then the uh, the reason why the scripture story came to mind is. I think a lot of people have heard of the like the story about Adam, Eve, serpent, fall, right? Mm-hmm. The fall mm-hmm. to sin. But another way of interpreting and creatively engaging that story is actually thinking of, about it as the rise to consciousness and the rise to being human, becoming human, mm-hmm. to be uh, the rise to becoming accountable and responsible human beings. So um, I think that this story, Umhalat, is in a way, almost like a in-the-garden um, 
unaccountable, like childlike level of consciousness Mm -hmm. because they don't know. They don't know the truth about the possibility of violence. They don't know the truth about their past um, violent relationships. They don't know the truth about other ways of being in the world. And so they don't, they're, the masses of people in Umhola are not given the opportunity to make the decision and consciously choose for themselves. They're not developed politically. Yeah. I would say like their utopia is just kind of imposed upon them. Yeah. Um, and, and obviously it's a lie because some of them exactly. are getting like, I don't know, like shot in the streets <laughs> um, uh, or in back alleys by these like so-called guardians who think they are the ones who are trying to protect everybody. Yeah, like I, I think the framing of the story is interesting because it's sort of, it puts the ideas like, oh, these people who are spreading the information, they're the one, they're identifying with that society and they're finding that society so more appealing. So, you know, it's like the way I, I, I can take that and I, I'm not convinced by it by the writing, but that's what, what it says. That, you know, the, these people who are, who are doing this and are spreading this information, they effectively want that to come into Amhelad and that Amhelad to become that. So in that way, that therein lies the justification. However, what, what you kind of have is this sort of blissful ignorance where you don't know, when, and, you know, without history, without future. Um, so it's... And, and especially in terms of the violence, which is strange because, you know, um, Le Guin famously are very clear and very strongly about it. And in her fiction, that shows up a lot, pacifist. And like, with, like uh, you know, politically so and, you know, like committedly actually so. So it's strange. I, I, I don't know. Um, Mahela seems to be... <sighs> it's either... It's either... A very crass way of trying to uh, to make a distinction between uh, or a distinction from Omalas, or it is going into that sense of like y- this can also seem like a utopia, but it's it, it seems fraught with issues. the The absence of consciousness and the violence at it, it, it play it's it's strange. It's definitely strange as a comparison to Omalas, and in a way that's like I can't. I find it more. Omalas is more in- easily taken as positive, and this one is more easily taken as negative in terms of a, as a story and what what impressions it leaves. It's like um, neither answer seems to be satisfactory in their contexts. Yeah, in some way, it actually makes me wonder if it's kind of like a liberal uh, love affair, like a like a one night stand with a um, with the secret police, like. Like, uh, these information gleaners are both far right wingers and communists, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) And so that's why we need the state. That's why we need the police, right? Because we have this good world. We have our so-called democracy and who's undermining our democracy, (laughs) both Trump and the communists. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. It just kind of popped in my head where... Th- that makes sense. That is from a convincing a liberal, reading. Yeah, kind of like from a, a more liberal reading, if you didn't have any other like, other way of engaging this text, you might end up saying, um, like, I'm all for democracy, but there are exceptions to the moment where we need to take, you know, we need to handle these people. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, and like, I think that... The specific, like the handling of the people and like the lack of knowledge is such a difficult point to swallow. Yeah, it's like because you're it, like the, this dangerous knowledge. Like maybe, but it's so strange. It's definitely strange. It, it leaves a bad taste in my mouth. And I don't know if, if someone has any idea of other scholarship or knows something else about this story or is something that we're missing. By all means, do tell us. I, I'd love to know. <laughs> Uh, if if there's anything that we're missing or that we're, we're sort of you know inverted commas getting wrong, but uh, or just a possible reading that didn't occur to us, because in all the ways that I I read this story and try and reread it and trying to get it, it, it feels a lot more impervious to a more, shall we say, uh, sort of optimist not optimist, uh, more charitable read in terms of Um Helad um, mm. does not come out well. <laughs> in any of my readings of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. 
Um, and one thing, I, I know we're kind of pushing on time, uh, but one of the last ideas that kind of just popped in my head uh, that we could kind of throw around for a second is, is this question around policing knowledge mm-hmm. and policing, I- policing ideas. Um, so we live in a postmodern world where the argument is that every idea matters and that every idea should be um, accessed. Uh, I think in particular, given conditions, certain situations determine a reality where uh, we do need to combat the spread of misinformation and wrong ideas yeah. and really, really dangerous ideas. Um, now, on the other hand, and this is all, you know, uh, I'm just thinking like in a more political sense, right? Mm-hmm. Um on the other hand, I do think it's really important to develop consciousness and not impose it. And so, yeah. and that requires a, like a, a process or, or a journey of, of engaging uh, ideas and allowing people to have the freedom to engage terrible ideas. So, I mean, I, I'm a new father, right? My, my daughter, she's uh, nine months old. But as she grows up, I mean, I want her to know about all of the, like, the terrible ideas and the terrible conceptions um, that exist in the world. Because I think it's actually more dangerous for her to not engage them um, and just kind of be, like, surprised one day uh, when, you know, when we no longer are, like, you know, spatially together or... um, like a, I think a right wing family, one in which I, I I would have grown up, and if you grew up in a conservative family, you know you there's a lot of like walls and barriers to other forms of knowledge and ways of thinking in the world, right? You have to guard yourself, you have to hide all that stuff. Um, but to me, I think it's not like a hey, all ideas are great. No, it's like I do want to uh, raise my daughter to understand why some ideas are really problematic and why um, others are are way you know better. But I think she has to critically engage them and, and to consciously develop and say, this is why um, this world is a good world or uh, these relations are better. And the, this is why these ideas or these practices and attitudes and habits are bad. I don't know. I, I Just kind of developing that consciousness as opposed to trying to build a wall and say, oh, you can never know about fascism because I'm afraid you're going to become a fascist, basically. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I, I get that sense. Like, I, I think, you know, we can, we can go on and on about, like, you know, the spaces where that can be a thing or not, and, you know, uh, but it's, these are things that exist and that have existed. Um, you know, um, it's the historian in me. It's stronger than me. Um, so we, we, we can't really, and, you know, the present, unfortunately, is showing us that. We can't really get away if we simply hide or try not to look at it or try to forget it's like not ne- that never works that has never worked um in nowhere in anything really um not even uh, fortunately uh, in terms of marxism like you know it's like oh marxism is dead communism is dead all that said anarchism is dead really 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 not really um so it requires an engagement. Like it's not by avoiding to engage or avoiding to to face that, and even the sort of and not like in that you know like that uh, that debate debate bros like debate me or it's like no not that but sure. like t- trying to understand these ideas. Not in, it's like why is this bad? Like it, it's like it's more about a sort of critical thinking and consciousness than it's just like oh this is better or this is worse. Like why these things are understood as that and why do we understand these things in this way or not and why do we find these a better way of looking at these things and or rather like why do we find both amhelas and omelas problematic or it's like not utopian societies like why do we find that more than like oh this is not utopian or this is you it's like why what defines that and like that's why for me like that's like the concept of utopia that I want to take is utopia is utopia if it is for everyone. And even that, it's not a perfect society. Like, it, that, that is impossible. There will be no perfect society. And whatever perfect inverted common society that is, it's either surrounded by imperfection or it's got a lot of skeletons on its closet. Just saying. So 
you, you can achieve that in terms of like a totality. There is no total utopia because that that annihilates history, that annihilates time, that annihilates society, difference. You know, the issues that the anti-utopians talked about when discussing the problems of literary utopias. So, and, and, that, and that makes sense. Like, that, you're never going to get that. And that's okay. That's not a problem. Like, to imagine the fact that there can be much better societies, but that still have problems, is not, that's not necessarily, it doesn't need to be a utopia to be better, but it can be utopian. And that's fine, as you know, this this horizon. It can be a horizon, but it can never be more than that. It's like it's, it, I'm going to start to be repetitive. Uh, I just wanted to mention, just wanted to recommend another story about, uh, you know, getting the, this, this idea of utopianism and, and so on. But the is, I haven't read it yet, but it's been well recommended to me. Um, Eminent Domain by Carl Neville. That effectively, it's like, oh, what if this thing happened and we won? Or like, you know, th- this you have this sort of more socialist society and that's the better the state of things. But what if there's, but what problem is there? And what other, and it's like a sort of a detective novel kind of thing uh, from what I've heard. I'm really, I really need to read it. But effectively, it's pushing that similar idea. Okay, society can be better, but what then? And like, that's not it. It's like, it's so... And that's the, the annoyance of the things like, oh, this better society, that's it. It's solved and it's boring. It's like that's such a simple, a simplistic way of looking at human relationships. And in that way, both the Mahalat and Omalas are kind of more believable in inverted commas because of their imperfections. Because any society will have imperfections. Mm. And I think like, how can we work against those same imperfections? That was a really long rant. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. No, 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 no. I think uh, I think you're absolutely right. And yeah, one of the things that both stories really push me to is this necessity of telling the truth and of being yeah. honest. And you know, uh, Mahela definitely lacks the existence of honesty. And while Omalas has that conscious level, it's also being de- it's also a uh, community and culture of dishonesty. They're not it's being ideology. honest. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a wrong and and it's a wrong ideology for sure. Yeah. So so yeah, I, I think that's that's kind of like one of perhaps like my main takeaway from reading these two mm-hmm. essays again is that we ought to really strive to be honest about ourselves, about our relationships. You know. Yeah. Uh, being. Uh, being truthful about how we really relate in the world to other people, even if that means doing some hard work and realizing, holy shit, we are involved in some pretty, uh, uh, in the production of other people's suffering. And so then we need to get to that place where we can make that decision of, do we walk away? Do we organize and fight? I don't know. Uh, all All the different options, but um, I think that challenge of being honest today is a is an incredible like political challenge today. No, I agree, and I think that that's probably the best takeaway we can get from this. Um, I think some of what the last things I wanted to mention is, as I mentioned before, the relationship that this story from Le Guin has to the dispossessed, uh, and uh, it has from to uh, to this character of Odo, and. Especially bringing back that that la- those last two sentences that those who walk away uh, know where they're going and are going through to an even more unimaginable place. I think what 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 that can mean, or, or one way I'd like to read it uh, in terms of the scout is like uh, Odo lived in a society which is very similar to our own, or at least you know Cold War Earth. That's the the, the equivalent, and. In that, there was a, a possibilities or you know existences that seemed better, that seemed utopian, that seemed magnificent, that seemed brilliant. But she saw in those imperfections and saw in them that that was not enough. So the the need or the call to walk away and to try and create something better, um, ultimately we can. You know, go on into like the fact of like the and then this possess goes on that and the fact of leaving and creating something else and not actually staying and fighting, but the 
the impulse in that sense is like, I try not to be complicit with that, trying to find that honesty there and that honesty of belief and action. Uh, because the ones who walk away, they are they're, they're sort of paralyzed by this. Well, not paralyzed, but you know, they're they're deeply changed by this idea of the child, and their society becomes intolerable. So they walk away. And it's like, in what ways can we, you know, equivalently speaking, but not completely, uh, walk away from our society? <laughs> Uh, to to bring it back to the Christian thing, uh, how we, we can be in the world but not of this world, mm. and I think that's one interesting way of of getting that idea of like walking away and in a way that's not just uh, you know a running away or an avoidance of issues, but like that is a part of the process. And, and maybe that's one of the things like it is necessary to walk away before you can stay and fight. Yeah, I think that's a great point, and um, something that you know might not come to mind immediately. But as you just said, walking away doesn't necessarily mean like avoiding. You know, it could be it yeah. could be an avoidance of, of a situation. But uh, there are other parts of our our lives where walking away is like the most liberative thing, both for you and the other people involved and stuff. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, all great questions. I I really appreciate you, Frank. Yeah, I appreciate you, Chase. Like really pushed me to thinking about these things and really appreciated having the discussion on the two stories and uh, the fact that, like we felt similarly about them, Helen. That, yeah, that, was, so that cool. was very special to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Strange and lost, but we, yeah. uh, we, but we made our way with each other, so that was good. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, it, it's kind of the thing that, and what I've been doing. Like, it's, it's really difficult to find answers. Answers are nigh on impossible. But we're, we're trying to ask better questions, mm. you know, and, and trying to, f if not answer those questions, you know, try to come up with better ways of framing those questions or, or thinking about that. And, you know, it, today, one of the ones we came up with is this necessity of the dishonesty. There's this uh, political internal understanding and criticism and honesty, really. And I think that's really beautiful to take away from. Absolutely, yeah. So... Any closing remarks? Although we've been doing that for a little bit. <laughs> no, no, I think um, I'm going to keep on sitting on uh, the whole uh, honesty and, and also the, the really interesting questions on ideology. I, I, I personally, I really like Omelas. Definitely, yeah. Uh, yeah, I encourage folks to read Omelas as well, um, the ones who stay and fight. But Omelas is a really fascinating essay. It's like four pages too, so a really short, easy yeah. read. And I'll probably re revisit every once in a while. Yeah, and I think, I know at least, like, because uh, I read uh, The Ones Who Walk Away from Mobilus from one of the books, I know The Ones Who Stand Fight is available for free online. And I think at this point, The Ones Who Walk Away from Mobilus is probably not that difficult to find either. So, no, you know, just Google that with a PDF. You'll find it. Yeah, definitely recommend you read them and read them both, like. Uh, we, we, you know, we had our readings and our, our preferences, but, you know, read them both. Like, do, if you have better suggestions or better interpretations for them, hell it, I'd love to hear them, honestly. Like, that's, that's the wonderful thing about working with literature. And it's like, you know, it's, you have better ways of answering or other ways, but like, none of that is really definitive. It's, it's really hard to come up with a definitive. And that's not the point, really. So, you know. Yeah, that's, yeah you're absolutely right. There's no one interpretation. <laughs> yeah. It can be more or less convincing, but it's not necessarily. It's like, oh, this is the way. No, absolutely not. That's anyone who says that. Oh, but this is what this is about. That's nonsense. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's the the literature point version for today. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you so much for this, Chase. This was so so much fun. Likewise, yeah. Where can people find more of your work, and where can they support you? Uh, Faith and Capital and Mass Struggle. Those are the two different podcasts. Faith and Capital is right now we're transitioning into um, a new direction where it's mostly just me as a communist engaging uh, more progressive uh, Christians on and, and trying to find points of unity. And we struggle in our conversations as well. Um, it's not just like, a, oh, yeah, we want the same thing because uh, a lot of times we don't, obviously. And so, but I, I do think uh, progressives and communists do have some things in, in, 
in common and uh, there are those things that we should be united around. So that's kind of the direction that I'm taking Faith and Capital. Mass Struggle podcast is um, just a bunch of me like reading and discussing, reflecting upon revolutionary theory. So if you're interested in learning more about Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, or revolutionary communist stuff, that's what that is about. Um, right now, it, right now, it's a lot about the mass line um, and organizing and some of the the the, the basic philosophical um, assumptions of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. Mm-hmm. Sounds yeah. good. And Frank, likewise, um, where can uh, Faith and Capital listeners find Frank Lopez? Well, you can find me. Uh, I'll find the left page. Uh, or we're on Twitter at, at Left Page Pod or at Frank Gothic, where I also share my. They're, they're both run by me because it's just me, but uh, you know, so it varies a little bit on what I do and what I post. But it's usually you know, utopianism, science fiction, literature, dystopias show up a bit when I am angry. But uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's all those things. It's, I mean, what what was the my, my new t- most recent Twitter name? It's Frank Utop- Utopian Gothic Marxist. Uh, utopian gothic marxist uh, and i'm also catholic so you know all those things show up in a really interesting way um, Love it. and i have fun with that and yeah so you'll find a bit of all of those things there and you know a lot of literature a lot of fiction and on the podcast you can expect us up as such and you can also find some of the bonus stuff that i write and, and record for on patreon at patreon.com forward slash left page excellent Cool. Thanks, Frank. Thank you so much, Chase. And uh, hopefully we'll 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 chat. You'll we'll have you back, or I'll be on uh, very soon. 